Hello and welcome back to CW Live. Great to be back in the studio again after our trip to Bournemouth last week for the CW conference. If you'd like to check out the highlights from the event, watch last week's show. Also, shout out to Ozzy, who really got into the spirit of things there. He dyed his beard pink. I love that dedication. This week, we've got a packed show. We'll be talking about network changes, saving call centers, and raising money for charity. So we'll go into that. But first, let's look at the latest news in the postal, comms, and tech industries. Let's start with an article in The Guardian. Union appears to accept Royal Mail proposal to cut most Saturday deliveries. It suggests that the CWU have appeared to accept a proposal from Royal Mail that would cut down letter delivery days from the current six days a week. Martin Walsh, our Deputy <coughs> General Secretary Postal, it's a mouthful, said that the USO as a six day option is no longer financially viable. And The Guardian suggests that after years of opposing a change to the USO, this comes as Kratinsky's supposed aim to be owner of Royal Mail comes about. The Sunday Times were equally as scathing, saying that the CWU have given in on the USO and are ready to back Royal Mail plans. We put the accusation directly to our DGS postal, Martin Walsh. Uh, hi all. Uh, you would have seen the article in the uh, Telegraph at the weekend saying the union supports uh, a cut in the USO. Uh, we just want to reassure you that this is not true. Uh, we've opposed... Ofcom's proposal on three or four day reduction of the USO. We've also opposed the speed of delivery service, which delays first class, which Germany is adopting, uh, and a couple of other speed of delivery options. What we have said is we recognise there has to be a change in the USO if raw mail is to be sustainable in the future. We're working with the company to look at a model which delivers six days a week first class. Uh, and has the least impact on the number of jobs, but increases Saturdays off. Uh, we're working with the company on this, uh, and we will communicate further in due course. Thanks for that, Martin. And to add to that, the show will be going live once again in a couple of weeks, and we'll have both Dave Ward and Martin Walsh on to share more about the CWU stance on the USO. And you'll have a chance to ask them the questions you want to uh, you want answers to rather live on air. At that moment in time, we'll be releasing more details about that soon, so do keep an eye out. Next up, some more light-hearted news. An OpenReach engineer is hanging up her boots after 50 years on the job. Alison Houston is the network's female engineer with the longest total service in the UK and the only person in the company's Scottish team of 3,400 to have served five decades. She joined back in 1974 when the company was still known as the General Post Office and at 68, she's now retiring. See, that's just wonderful. Alison said she was thoroughly happy being an engineer, and that's what it's all about, right? If you're happy somewhere, got amazing colleagues, satisfied with your work, then what more can you ask for? I mean, I personally can't imagine myself somewhere for 50 years, but that's because I'm fidgety. I don't know if you can tell. Who knows? Maybe if CW Live turns 50. But what about you all? How long have you been working where you are? Do let us know. Last up, there's some rumblings amongst big tech companies as the UK com competition regulator is trying to investigate more into their partnerships with AI startups. This is one to keep an eye on because the more companies that are snapped up by big tech firms like Microsoft, <coughs> Meta, Google, Amazon, the more power they monopolize between them, the less fair competition there is. And crucially for our Utah members, it could mean that navigating within the AI industry becomes more problematic in terms of availability, rights, pay, especially in an area as unregulated in the UK as AI is at the moment. Right, that does it for industry news for now. Next, let's talk about a certain call centre in Enniskillen. You may have heard that a BT call centre that provides support to EE customers is looking to be shut by the company later this year. It employs around 300 people, which is a fairly big number. But the call centre means a lot more to the region, uh, the region rather than just that. Now, the union is campaigning to keep its doors open and we've brought on Consumer National Officer Stephen Album to tell us more about that. Stephen, welcome. Hi, Omar. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Not too bad. Thank you very much for coming on. Right. First of all, what is the situation in Enniskillen exactly? On the 8th of February, uh, EE announced that Enniskillen was not part of its long-term strategy um, and they were going to consider a potential closure. Now, as part of that, they opened an expression of interest uh, for any members who wanted to take an early voluntary leave of payment. Um, 
uh, with a guaranteed date of the 31st of December if it potentially closed. Now, obviously, that came as a huge shock to the members in Enniskillen because, as we say, the, the, the job market there, we're told by local LMAs, is very challenging. Mm. I think it has a very challenging infrastructure as well, and I think the nearest site that people could be reloc relocated to would be Belfast, which would be an additional five hours. So, as I, as I say, it's a, it was a significant shock and caused a lot of stress within the site. Right, and it's not just that, it's also the main employer in the area as well, isn't it? So this means a lot more to the region than usual. Yes, of course. I think um, if you look at if you look at Enniskillen, it is the main employer in the town of Enniskillen. And obviously, you know, as part of the campaign, we've spoken to a lot of uh, the shops and outlets and restaurants and uh, the impact it'll have on them will be significant. Mm. And why exactly do they want to shut the centre down? Is it just a cost-saving exercise? Um, well... A number of years ago, BT announced what, what they called a better workplace program, where they were looking at reducing the number of uh, call centres it had, uh, or desk-based workers it had within the company. Now, underneath that, obviously, sits uh, AE Consumer, who also have a decision to make on what their location strategy is going to be. And as part of that, AE have a decision to make uh, on Enniskillen. Right. And you've talked to the employees there, and I'm guessing the majority want to keep it open, obviously. But then there was a survey done with employees who left the company voluntarily too, right? And, and what did that survey show? Well, that came about because what we found out very, very early, EE were not running the early voluntary release scheme in the spirit of the Bluefin Agreement, which they were doing it under. Um, what they did is anyone who took the EVS was guaranteed that end date of 31st of December, the potential end date if it closed. But anyone who wanted to stop and fight for their jobs yeah. were going to be potentially financially punished because they wouldn't guarantee that same end date for the people who wanted to fight for their jobs. Now, we wrote to the company and said, members feel blackmailed here and put under financial pressure to take it when they didn't want to take it. Yeah. And to, to, to back that up, we surveyed, a, a local MLA surveyed all the members and 74% of the people who'd taken the release scheme said that they've only took it because of that undue pressure and would prefer presence were kept in Enniskillen, which was, in, in my view, totally unacceptable. Right. And so what exactly is the union doing at the moment to help campaign to keep this open? So I think initially what we wanted to do was remove all the arguments for the company not to keep a presence. Now, clearly, if you look at Enniskillen, it has, one of the, it has the lowest attrition across the EE sites. Mm. They're very long-term, loyal employees. Um, and, equ you know, and equally the high performing, highly skilled. But additionally, we wanted to speak to the economy minister and we had a meeting with Conor Murphy and Invest NI to see what support be could, be get could be given. And they detailed that in a letter as part of our business case that we presented to the company, uh, training costs, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, access to new buildings, uh, other financial support and actually also said they were well, more than happy to o overcome uh, any barriers and that was crucial for Conor Murphy because his policy is economic balance he wants jobs right across across Northern Ireland and we presented that business case to the company and had a meeting on the 18th of May unfortunately um, they have now written to members and said it's not something they can commit to which again has caused huge problems for us so Obviously, we've requested further meetings and the fight goes on. In our opinion, the ball is in the company's court. You know, we've removed any argument why they can't keep a presence. And we believe that they should do that for all the reasons around the very challenging job market that they've got and that infrastructure and the massive impact it will have on lives. I think it's important to say when speaking to members, we've had members who took mortgages out the day before the announcement. We have members who went on maternity leave the day before they went on the announcement. We have members with disability and caring needs and, you know, losing this job would have a significant impact on them, major impact on them. You know, and I think we're really, really worried about our members' mental health at this time. So just to go back on to that, actually, um, in regards to removing those barriers in which they could justify closing the centre down, you know, the mm. economic reasons. Yeah, yeah. So if you're doing that, for what reason, why would they say we can't commit to that? I think, it's, I think in our opinion, it's a can't do, won't do. I think we've demonstrated they can do it. Right. But, they're, but they're, clearly, they don't want to. And I think that's, you know, as far as we're concerned, I think you always have to, whilst we appreciate there'll be a site strategy, I think there are times when we have the challenges that I've mentioned, you have to look at that and do the decisions for the right reasons. Now, the company have said they've invested heavily in Belfast and, and, and they've invested in, in other parts of uh, EE, in the, sorry, BT, within, within um, Northern Ireland. But that's what it's about. This is about a moral decision they have to make. 
the consequences of this are significant mm. and if they don't make that decision it's going to have a significant impact on those members and i mean a very significant impact so i think with us removing those arguments i think they have to make the right decision the right moral decision mm. and, and and maintain a presence within enniskillen because that's the thing you know the, the main reason why we have this company at the moment is because of the human element uh, yeah, element of exactly. it exactly but if you take away all of the um economic reasons as to why they would want to close this down the only other one i could think of is they would want to condense the number of sites that they would have and make those certain sites bigger, like belfast for instance and mm. make those bigger so have a lower number of sites but make them bigger in order to justify mm. it in terms of finance would you say that was probably one of the reasons why yeah obviously like i think you're right it is a cost saving exercise but i think as well these are long-term loyal employees I think you can have a site strategy when you understand it. We might not appreciate it, mm. but we understand it. And in other sites that where we have solutions, we you know that, that those things have happened. But this is a very unique situation. Mm. It's a very unique situation where they have to do the right thing. And I think you know when you use an EVS scheme, sorry, an early voluntary leave scheme or an expression of interest, the scheme is about finding those who genuinely want to go. Yeah, genuinely want to leave. And then we have a number of people we can find a solution for. Now that number has been completely polluted because of the way they've handled this, the, the the expression of interest and put that financial pressure on. So we haven't even got the right numbers, and I think that isn't in the spirit of the agreement. And we wouldn't want that to happen in any uh, any sort of potential site closure. We want it to be done in the right way, and I think they haven't done that, and I think it's totally unacceptable. And you said that um, those who have already voluntarily left, you know, a number of them they as haven't well, left yet. They've expressed an interest. They've expressed yeah, an yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They themselves still don't want to leave either. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, so I think if you look at if you look at it, because we we've had three big meetings with members, so we have spoken to virtually every member, and there are genuinely people who want to go, and that we know that number, but we know of the people of all the other of all the people who have expressed an interest, seventy three percent of those based on the survey, have only took it because of that financial pressure. They actually want to stay, but they can't afford to lose if the site shuts early and not have that guaranteed date of the 31st of December that all the members who have took the uh, expression of interest for mm. the leave have got. Wow. So it puts them in a really difficult position. So that... Well, to, to put it bluntly, basically, we believe EE have punished members for uh, wanting to fight for their jobs. <laughs> Um, okay, obviously you guys are campaigning at the moment. What else can our members do to help support this campaign? Well, look, we need to. We need we, we, what we're going to do. Obviously, we we brief members. Um, we'll be briefing members on Friday for, for an update. I think additionally, we've got further meetings with the, with the, the politicians because obviously, I think Conor Murphy made it very clear that if it was closed, there'd be reputational damage. I think what we want to let the public know in Northern Ireland and as far as wide as we can that we have put a reasonable business case for the company. There is a, there is, they have got the option mm. to do something and maintain a presence. Now, obviously, if they don't do that, then obviously, clearly, the fight will go on. The campaign will continue, and it could be a very different campaign to what it is now. I think all we're saying to EE is, look, we've removed all the arguments for you not doing it. You have clearly the option to do it. Mm. You haven't got any reasons not to do it. Um, and then if you do close the site, then obviously, uh, that won't be the end of it. The, the, the campaign will go on. Cheers for that, Stephen. Much appreciated. Thanks for coming in. Next up is union business. Now, what is going on over in the CWU itself? Let's go over the latest that's happening within the union. Now, the obvious thing to talk about is last week's conference, but we've talked enough about the speeches and discussions. So let's pivot to something a little bit more heartwarming. South Wales, Southwest Divisional Rep Ralph Ferret did something. He shaved his hair off as part of a commitment he made to branches at conference. This was part of an overall £6,500 made for CWHA at the annual conference. While we were at conference, I was approached by CW Humanitarian Aid and I was asked to see if I could make sure that the postal conference raised more money from ticket sales than the telecoms conference did. I'm happy to tell you all I was able to do so. And postal raised £3,400 to the £700 that were raised in the telecoms conference. So Karen and uh, TFSE, you need to do a bit more work next year. But while I was going around doing my fundraising, Dave Jones of the Wolverhampton and District of Mal pointed out that last time I tried to raise some serious money at conference, I had my hair shaved um, for charity. And Dave said that the credit union that he's part of would weigh in an extra £250 if I agreed to have my hair cut off again. Now, bearing in mind that I reject the proposition that my faux hawk represents a ridiculous haircut, 
you know, is for charity. So I told Dave that if we matched the £3,000 that I raised in 2008, I would once again cut my hair off. And as I said at the start of this video, that figure was easily matched by Postal Conference. So I'm here today to let my hair be cut off. Um, so then, uh, here we go. Goodbye hair. I do think there's some merit to the idea of a charity that's run by people you know, people who come from a place like you. And that's what CWUHA is. It's a charity from the union. It's made up of people who are postal workers and telecom workers, members of our union, people who work in offices like the offices that you and I work. And over the years, since 1995, they've raised millions of pounds worth of like aid for some really really great charities i just wanted to encourage anyone who's watching this video to consider affiliating to cwha your branch can do it if you're a cw activist or you can do it as an individual so uh dig deep and if you haven't donated already please donate to cwha thanks Incredible by Ralph. It's an amazing amount that the charity raised at the conference, by the way, around £6,500. Also, you may have spotted the shirt that he's wearing and that I'm wearing too. A football shirt designed by CWHA for football team Kilimahewa School FC that they're sponsoring in Tanzania, being sold to help raise money and awareness. But again, thank you to Ralph for your pledge and for following through. Thank you to all those who donated and anyone else who wishes to donate or has a plan to raise money themselves, go to CWHA and email into them. Next, we're going to be talking about network changes. I'll be totally honest with you, I haven't a clue about the complexities of it. I've read documents and tried my hardest to figure it out, but it's best that I let the experts talk. Earlier on, I spoke to National Executive Council member Tony Bush. Tony, thanks for chatting to us on the go. Okay, let's get right into it. Network changes. Can you give us the lowdown on what's been going on? Yeah, afternoon, everyone. Um, obviously, from a uh, CW perspective, we did an agreement uh, last year, Business Recovery Transformation Agreement, which captured uh, a big change that the business was trying to introduce, which was Network Window, which is, in essence, uh, the company removing 18 flight sectors from the, the network uh, and moving that onto road. Uh, and as a result of that, previously, the company wanted to be in a position where those changes would meant the start and finish with chimes would change in delivery offices by up to three hours. Um, and obviously in the negotiations and through the agreement, we negotiated that to be capped at a maximum of 90 minutes. Uh, and obviously we would endeavour to get that less than 60 minutes. And obviously through the last uh, 12 months, we've got to a situation where there's over a thousand delivery offices that are below 60 minutes in terms of that impact. Uh, obviously, 250 plus are, are, are above that, but we've put further mitigations in place to try and reduce that by a further 15 minutes. Um, and we're hopeful when that change goes live, starting from the 13th of May of this year, and then when the official network review goes in on the 17th of June, then we will uh, un uh, agree a PIR process with the company, which right. will review those times to see whether it can be bettered going forwards. Okay. Um, the members in Scotland are almost as a block are upset with the proposed network changes. We're going to have a separate session with them and Martin Walsh, but some of those time changes there go well beyond an hour. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. You are right. And um, so what the, what the agreement was, the agreement committed both sides that we would endeavor to do that by 60 minutes, but the business reserved the right where uh, we weren't able to put mitigation in place to move those changes from start and finish times to up to 90 minutes. Um, now, there's about 250 offices that are greater than 60 minutes. We've already given those units the ability to reduce that to 75. But again, we're doing everything we can possible, which is, I think, why you'll get Martin on specifically for the Scotland issue, because we're trying to advance work into the mail centres, which would then mean we can improve the start and finish times in those delivery offices in Scotland even better. And as you say, we have actually improved the situation and continue to do so. Will this work be finished before changes are implemented? So the first set of changes started to get introduced from the 13th of May. Uh, and obviously that's been communicated to all of those delivery offices and individuals have had uh, an opportunity to go for an exceptions process and appeal where, whether they've got family friendly issues, childcare issues, disability, etc. So that's that's a live situation now and that's uh, that's ongoing. Obviously there are talks that Martin and the national officers are taking place in mm -hmm. where... We believe the business have been over-cautious in terms of some of their planning 
Uh, and we're currently looking at that in the number of mail centres in Scotland to see whether or not that, that over-cautiousness has led to those units being greater than 60 minutes and actually whether we can better that now. Uh, and that's a live negotiation that Martin's involved in currently. Okay, so it's happening right now. Gotcha. Um, this is a massive issue for our members. It fundamentally goes against why so many took the job in the first place. People will be forced to leave. Your message to those members? No, I think, I think the whole of the CW knows this was a difficult subject matter. And that's why the dispute last year was really, really bitter. Because if you go back to that dispute, what the business was saying for people that worked in delivery mm. is we want to move you to 9 to 5. We want to move the network by three hours. Uh, and that was why we had the dispute. And that's why we took 18 days of industrial action. Now, what the agreement did is the agreement cut that change at 90 minutes. And obviously, look, the, the 90 minutes will be dependent on where you are in the UK. If you're in the central belt of the UK, you get your mail much earlier than you do in Scotland, than you do in Truro uh, and other part, parts of the UK. So, I mean, there's, we've always had a staggered start and finish times around the UK because it's the nature of the UK geography that, you know, you will be closer to a mail centre in the Midlands area uh, than you are in some of the rural areas. So there's that. But, you know, I think it... I understand, and I think the union understands completely for those members that are greater than 60 minutes how difficult that change is. But, you know, we've we've currently got a last letter time of 15.30. That's moved by an hour. And, and obviously, we've tried to mitigate that. And the fact that we've got over a 1,000 officers that are below 60 minutes is an achievement. But we've got to do more to protect those 250 officers that are greater than 60 minutes. And obviously, that work's ongoing. And I'm, I am... I know. I think that our members might think the union sounds like a broken record on this point, but we are confident when we get into the post implementation review that we will be able to prove that the business has been overcautious. Hmm. Okay, but we are hearing reports that Royal Mail are not taking the exemptions process seriously. Are you picking this up? And what should members do if that is the case? Yeah, so we're absolutely alive to that situation. I think in the last 24 hours, I think we've sent at least 20 examples of that to the company where we believe the exemption process has not been applied in the spirit and intent of which we've agreed it. You know, individuals' uh, circumstances have not been factored into that. Um, and what I would say to any member that's in a situation where they feel aggrieved that their exemption process hasn't been followed in line with the process and or their appeal hasn't been taken seriously, that they really need to escalate that to their CW rep. The CW uh, rep needs to raise that with their branch and the area rep. Uh, and ultimately that will get passed up to headquarters so that we have a portfolio where we can say to the company mm. we agreed this review and these are the facts behind it okay just for that tony really appreciate that thanks for coming on and that about does it for this week thank you so much for tuning in to cwu live as always we really appreciate you being here and supporting us and as always if there's a question you'd like answered something or someone you'd like to see on the show in the future or perhaps you wanted to share your thoughts on things so far comment down below we'll see you again next week until then Stick with the union.